You're listening to the Blue Raider Podcast, your number one resource for all the latest news, updates, and game recaps from Middle Tennessee Athletics. Join us every Tuesday for our weekly interviews with players, coaches, and local media personalities alike. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to like and subscribe on all our socials. We're on Instagram, X, Twitter, and TikTok, at Blue Raider Pod. If you're currently listening on your favorite streaming service, we also offer a visual presentation on YouTube at Blue Raider Podcast. Lastly, I'd love to hear your feedback, so don't forget to subscribe to GoMiddle.com to discuss this week's episodes along with the latest news and updates around Middle Tennessee. Welcome in to the Blue Raider Podcast. I'm your host, Jake Bolden, and today is Tuesday, April 23rd. In today's edition of the Blue Raider Podcast, you got me solo once again this week, so Happy to break down some off-season news in regards to football to expand upon last week's conversation with Austin Lewis, as well as get into some conversation about the newest signees for basketball on the men's side. I know last week me and Austin were able to touch on the ladies, and I've alluded to it all off-season now since the season ended there in early March that there will be some more additions hopefully soon. I don't know when, I don't know who, but I know that the Lady Raiders are still active on that trail, so... When that time comes, we'll obviously touch base with those new signees. But um, to extend our conversation from last week after the spring game, um, as we Coach Mason spoke on in his post-game press conference, there's going to be a lot of names that get shaken up this time of year as the portal opens up once more for two more weeks, and it'll close on May 1st. Um, as of today, uh, which is a Monday night recording before the release, uh, the Raiders have... 12 names that have entered the portal since last weekend, which is quite a few, but I think the biggest thing is to not be alarmed as, as Mason would probably tell you the same. The biggest names in there right now is offensive lineman, Wilson Kelly, and then cornerback Deontay Stanley. I think when we look back at the spring game, Kelly may be the biggest surprise. He was a big producer last year on the offensive line, played majority of the season there. Uh, Deontay Stanley did start most of the season at cornerback however it does appear that his starting position is gone um so not too much of a surprise there and like i said mason in his post game always said that you're going to have your ones it's those twos and threes and those depth pieces that may be looking for opportunities somewhere else and he fully anticipates those transfers transfers taking place and um uh, outside of that too you've got guys like dj riles and kyle Lowe, who were both quarterbacks they were younger on the depth chart for sure but when you're looking for that playing time or those opportunities to start you know you're always looking to, to better your situation and move on to those schools and so we've seen mtsu's interest shift as far as a transfer portal goes at trying to pick up more backup quarterback help outside um we've got body auto as the one and richardson as the the clear cut number two so um, what do you do there with the three? Well, you know you have Gagliano, who's only a freshman, so you may – most programs will typically hold a fourth one. You like to have a quarterback at each class. I'm not saying that's how it has to be done, but that seems to be where the Raiders are headed in regards to offers in the transfer portal. I know they're looking to bolster up the defensive line as well, so and you won't see any sort of commitments right out the gates from this transfer portal opening, but you do expect to see some here – um, as the school year wraps up here in early May, you see those commitments because those guys are going to roll in here for their summer programs, um, get in with a strength conditioning program and do all that that good stuff. But I think the key thing for us Raider fans is that Coach Mason feels good about a starting 11 on both sides. He didn't really allude to any sort of positions that he thinks needs to be added as far as starters go. So it, it, he seems good good with the lineup and i'd have to say from the the starting 11 although the teams were split up i felt pretty good about them too so um those are the four names that kind of stand out to me as far as who has entered the portal but i wouldn't be too alarmed because obviously mason doesn't seem to be too alarmed about it either it's kind of an expectation um but in in regards to returning this last week we've got the news that richard kenley would be returning uh, which is huge news for the front seven um he, linebacker last year highly produced he entered the transfer portal after stock still was gone and then he had committed to memphis partook and memphis's spring program spring game and then has re-entered the portal and without um really much time to think about it he returned back to mtsu so it's excellent news especially for continuity's sake um because the front seven is an area that i think me and austin um, no needs help, and I think Mason would probably agree with that too, but having a guy that it's experienced like Kenley can get back in there, um, although he's going to have a new defensive coordinator, I still think he's going to plug and play. He'll be he'll have his starting position once he comes back, and I think that's always an important thing when you're talking about what goes on 
um, in, a, in a roster depth chart makeup in Division One football today, not just here at MTSU, is that there's only so many starting positions available in the country in Division One, and a lot of these guys, when you have your starting position, um, it's hard to go somewhere else and then earn said position. So I know a lot of people love to talk about how crazy the transfer portal can be, but understandably so. Um, if you're a middling player who can't quite get the playing time that they think that they deserve, it's hard to sit around and wait as a fan for that progression to see in that player because he's ready to start playing now. And, and the only way to really get your best progression is in quality playing time. So it's hard to keep a quality um, back up in today's game. I mean, it's always hard to promise playing time in the future because you, you next year you roll into the same boat with transfer. So um, I still think collectively right now, MTSU's ones are in a great place, but we will see what Mason and company are able to do as they, as they scout out the transfer portal for their backups. So that'll switch our attention over to basketball's offseason. I know that a lot has happened there in regards to players entering the transfer portal for the Blue Raiders. Uh, most notably, you've got your leading scorer, Justin Porter, who's entered the portal, as well as your big man down low, Jared Coleman-Jones, also entering the portal. Something interesting about Coleman Jones is the amount of um, Power 5 offers he's had on the table since he's entered the portal. I think it was a late um, addition to the portal that not many of us saw coming, but it seems like he's got quite the offers on his plate, so hopefully he does better for himself there and um, gets to a place where he can get seen and be happy. I don't know that he was ever un unhappy here, but there's always bigger and better things for those guys to do, and so... Obviously, I wish Jared Coleman Jones the best, and if he ever decides to make the return, I know that as we sit today uh, at the end of April that we could certainly use him back because we haven't quite found the five yet. I know that we have Chris Loof on roster. Um, he definitely has the length. You know, you're hoping to see that progression in the weight room this summer, and you get him to that point where he can be a solid five without fouling because that always seems to get him in his biggest trouble. Obviously, you want him to get more comfortable scoring the basketball, and we kind of saw glimpses of that there in the Conference USA tournament, both of those games. Um, so there's a lot of development to happen there, but we're still kind of missing that five. And with Jared entering the portal, it is only going to make that tougher. So I do expect if Jared doesn't make a return, that we do look forward to making a pickup at the transfer portal at the five position, a uh, true center, I should say. So um, as far as what the Raiders have picked up so far, they've picked up a trio of players. They have Jared Hall from Tulsa. Alec Oglesby from Stetson, and Jalen Counter from IUPUI. Um, and we'll do a, a quick breakdown here of all these guys. I think the first one that came through was Jared Hall, who's a forward, six foot eight freshman from Lebanon High School here in Tennessee. I know a name that um, a lot of, if anyone that follows high school basketball closely in the mid-state has seen that name before as he was a Mr. Basketball winner in 2023 for 4A, the highest division that is in Tennessee. Um, a nominee for McDonald's All-American, number one ranked player in Tennessee, as well as the 65th in the country by Preps Hoop. So he was an ESPN four-star. Um, he's quite, he has all the intangibles. I mean, he he's a guy that has great length in, in high school. He could score the ball. I, I know that um, he was very capable of dropping 30 and I, I believe he averaged 27 his senior year of high school, 10 rebounds, three assists. I mean, he's a he was an absolute ball player in high school, and, and he had all the accolades to go along with it. So he goes to Tulsa, doesn't quite experience the playing time that I th think he probably thought he deserved. And it is a head-scratcher when you look at the Tulsa makeup. They're a pretty average team on paper. I think they were close to 500. Um, Jared didn't get many minutes there, but again, him being his six foot eight frame is definitely some size that you're looking forward to seeing here at MTSU. Um, as I've already alluded to, his high school stats, he's capable of scoring. I understand that Division One is not 4A Tennessee high school basketball, but the guy has the ability to score at all three levels. If you look at some of his tape, he shoots it from all three levels with comfort for the most part. And, and almost all of his contests this last year, he at least attempted A3. I think it's 20, 20 attempts on nearly 30 games. So he's comfortable out there. Obviously, if he has an uptick in minutes, those attempts would go up. Um, but he's only... a a 30% shooter from the field, which is always worrisome. But again, his volume, his numbers aren't really there for that to be a, an effective um, number for me. Only 49 actual shot attempts on 30%. So it's it's hard to say, you know, how much of that. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to transfer those numbers right now with so little playing time. But you know, this guy has the talent. He has the skill. He has the length to be competitive in Division One. It's just a matter of, I think, him being in the right system 
that he could excel and be a great pickup for the for the Raiders. And so as it sits right now, he is 6'8". I don't look at him as a center, although he has good length. I still consider him more of a four. So he could potentially slide into that four spot. I don't know that McDevitt sees him as a starter right now, but there's not a lot of depth at the four spot, especially with JCJ in the portal. So he could potentially be a starter as, as we see it right now. But I just don't have a lot of game film to myself to necessarily feel comfortable with saying that he would be a starter. Um, but there's a lot to be said, a lot of development to be seen, um, as well as what McDevitt will, you know, compare him to talent-wise and within his own bench to kind of see where he falls. But right now he he's up on the depth chart just given the length and and the and the lack of depth the Raiders currently have and the front court. But a guy that I do believe would start right out the gate for us is the Stetson pickup. He is a senior guard, um, Alec Oglesby. He's from Gainesville, Florida, six foot five. He's this will be his fourth stop in college. He started his career at Cleveland State before transferring to Wilmington, where he got hurt, and now he's been at two seasons at Stetson as a part of the Hatters program that was at March Madness this last year and. He was a key pivotal pivotal part of their success this last year. He's a guy that averaged double digits at the 10.7 points per game. Um, he's a great, pretty good rebounder from the guard position, nearly averaged five rebounds a game. Um, and, and his assist to turnover ratio is positive. So it's stuff like that that is, you, you, you love to see those numbers, uh, even for a guard. He's, again, he's not a true point guard. So, but having a positive turnover. Uh, assist to turnover ratio at, at a guard position is always promising. So you know he has a, he has a knack for the game. He has a good high IQ. Shooting percentage is one of those things that really pops out to you. He's a 42% shooter from the field, but he's a 40% shooter from three. That's on 186 attempts. And when you look at film from this last year, that's an area that he's very comfortable with. He's able. To, he does a lot of his shooting um, off the off the pass. He's not a dribble. He's not a dribble driver for the most part. He can shoot the three in transition. Um, I just I, I I like his game a lot. He's not one that's going to get to the to the foul line. He doesn't have a lot of free throw attempts because, as I say, he's one that kind of hunts hunts the three point line. He does a great job about um, scoring without the basketball. As they say, he's always he's always finding that open space. Um, a teammate's always there to kind of hit him. And again, at a forty percent clip, he's a guy that opposing defenses can't afford to lose. So. I think he's an instant starter for this team. He could be a huge factor in regards to seeing a, a, an uptick in in point production. Now that you're going to have Cam Weston back, if Oglesby takes over that two or three position, I do consider him more of a three, just given the fact that he's not necessarily um, that comfortable with the ball in his hands, but he has the length. So I don't know if he puts him it where McDevitt fits him into the program or in the scheme of things offensively, but. I have to think that you find a way to, to get this guy in there and get this guy minutes. And I don't think he would come to MTSU given his last year of college at the promise that he wouldn't be playing. So I, I assure that Raider fans should be looking forward to Ogles becoming to Murfreesboro. He was a key part in the March Madness run for the, for the Hatters. And so you hope that he can be um, kind of a, a breath of fresh air for us in regards to some scoring talent now that, that Porter's gone and, and we're getting Weston back. And then the third pickup for the Raiders um, from Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis, also known as IUPUI, uh, was Jalen Counter. He's a junior guard, six foot three, from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He has started his college career at Northern Oklahoma College, Enid, um, which is a junior college, before he transferred in as a sophomore to IUPUI. This last year, he was a third-team All-Horizon League honoree. He started 29 of the 31 games. He was the Jaguars' leading scorer with 14 points per game, had over 100 assists, um, and ranked second on the team in minutes and steals. So he's a guy that, again, was kind of the leading producer for IUPUI. I know when a lot of Raider fans see him enter the chat in regards to being a transfer pickup for us and you look at the record of IUPUI and his tenure there um, less than stellar to say the least uh, IUPUI is not necessarily um, a basketball juggernaut if you will um, but he's been their leading producer and I've had the luxury of being able to look at some of the of the game film from him and I think there's a lot of um, intangibles about him that do impress me that again if you're just looking on paper may get overshadowed um, and again just looking at the team itself it's, it's a pretty sorry team but he was kind of the bright spot for that team he averaged 
in his career there over the two years, 14.4 points. Um, but he shoots the ball at 46% from, um, as, a, as a point guard. Those are excellent numbers. He, he's not a great three-point shooter, 32%. But to be fair, he doesn't really – I mean, he, sh- he shoots 77 last season, which is roughly three a game. But in, I guess in the grand scheme of things, he doesn't shoot the ball – that much from three um he has high assist numbers but again if you look at his stat lines he's also has high turnover numbers so there's reasons to be alarmed there but when i watch film on him he just he has great eyes and i think part of it is he's so aggressive because of the team he plays for and raider fans can certainly understand that when your offense is bad much like iupu eyes was um you got to have to force the issue sometimes, and that was kind of the boat he's in. When you're the, the leading scorer on a bad offensive team, you get put into situations where you have to create offense for other players, and sometimes you force bad passes. Sometimes you you just you overthink the game itself, and he's still, and for the most part, he's young. As a sophomore and junior, he's only three years of college experience and only two in Division One level. I just think that there's a lot of promise with this guy. I don't think that Counter is going to start. I think that's a given um, with – Cameron coming back this year. Um, Counter is uh, assuredly a one. He's not going to play a shooting guard or anything like that, despite him being a, a great scorer. He could. I don't, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not McDevitt. I, I haven't seen his scattering report on him, but I would I would assume that he's going to be the backup point guard to Weston this year. Um, but with the scoring ability, he could, you know, we could see a mix where you have him and Weston on the court at the same time, but I think that's unlikely. But with him on the roster now, you feel good about having a true backup to Weston because that was what this team lacked last year when Weston got hurt. There's no other point guard on the roster. So now with Counter in the mix, you do have a true point guard. You've got to feel good about that because of what happened last year. This guy's a scorer. Um, he does have the ability to find the open shooter. Again, three assists a game is nothing to bat an eye at. The the 3.3 turnovers a game, that is something to really pay attention to. But the, I, th- I do think if you fit him into a better offensive system that he could really excel, especially in his first year here in Murfreesboro as a backup. I think that um, there's a lot there's a lot of room for growth here, and I think that uh, Blue Raider fans should be excited about Counter, um, aside from his, his previous stop there in Indianapolis. So that's kind of our breakdown on the roster so far. I, there's still a, plenty of names. The Raiders still have plenty of scholarships to go. Um, we haven't seen landing spots for those that have entered the portal like Ozell Jackson and um, Porter and Coleman Jones. So I think one thing that people always assume is that when those names enter the portal that they're never coming back. And so one thing I would like to assure the fans that may think that there's a possibility that they come back, they always can. And th- this was a topic of discussion that came up over at Go Middle was – do these guys have the opportunity to come back? And for those that are out there that may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always considered the transfer portal more of like a pro equivalent to the pro level of free agency. These players have the ability to come back, but it is on the same accord for the team to let them back. Um, there's been speculation that that's what happened with players in the past is that they've entered the portal. They got some offers, um, but nothing that they really wanted, but they wanted to come back. And at that point, you know, their scholarship spot has been given up or their teammates decide that it's probably not best that you come back because of you already leaving. So, you know, that's pure speculation on my part, but just understand that just because they've entered the portal doesn't mean that these players can come back. And the same could be said for the Lady Raiders. I know that a lot of people didn't like to see Grabowski enter the portal. Um, but there's always an opportunity that those players come back, and I'm sure if the um, chemistry is still there, the players would always you know, love to have them back. So that's our breakdown right now of the men's basketball offseason. Again, that's Jared Hall, Alec Oglesby, and Jalen Counter. I think they all provide something new to the team. I think they will all provide production their first year back, and I think that's important when you're hitting the transfer portal is that you're finding people that can make an impact now. Maybe not necessarily on your starting five, but they can provide quality minutes. And I think all three of these guys, especially Oglesby, who more than likely does impact your starting five, but guys like Jared Hall and Jalen Counter are both guys that I would expect to see 15 plus minutes a night, if not 20 plus minutes a night. Um, and, and one thing about Jared is the length that he provides in Counter at only six foot three, but again, still a guy that 
I think he has he has enough D1 experience. We have enough tape on him to feel comfortable about what we're getting with him. So they could both of those guys could certainly have an impact off the bench for us this year. Finally, we'll move into the Raider wrap up episode where we just go over the last week in MTSU sports, and we will start with the positive, um, and that is the MTSU's men's tennis program. They pick up their fifth straight Conference USA Championship, which is absolutely outstanding. You don't need me to tell you that. I would have loved to have um, the tennis program on today to kind of talk over their five straight wins, um, conference wins, uh, before they get their selection show this weekend. But unfortunately, timing wasn't well. But we will have them on next week to talk about their championship. And even better, we'll have a selection um, and we'll be able, and I'll be able to break down the selection as well as their upcoming tournament. And it, it's just, it's great to see your best programs succeed. I know we talk about that with women's basketball, but if you don't know anything about the tennis program, and this is your first time ever hearing about it, you should know that winning five straight conference championships is no easy feat, but this program has certainly made it look easy. And this weekend at our home, brand new outdoor tennis complex, they took down um, another ranked opponent in Liberty, a 53rd ranked Liberty team who looks really good on paper. Um, the Raiders take down the doubles point thanks to um, the 26th ranked um, doubles pairing of Ray Queen and Horak. Those guys have certainly turned it up. And I know that going into the year, talking to Born Dame in the preseason breakdown, that you know he thought maybe he'd break up the Kamarowski Horak doubles grouping. And he, he's got Ray Queen and Horak, and they seem to be clicking. And again, they're 26 in the country. So they're no slouch. And I would imagine when it comes time to doubles NCAA tournament that those are that's a pair to keep an eye out for and Ray Queen is an exceptional singles player himself winning both of his this weekend um in the championship match he, he wins in two straight sets which is huge for us Kamrowski is another one and he actually um was it was a big one really close there near the end Jakob Kroslak was absolutely dominating for us um and and Kroslak is the 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 winning set so if you look on Twitter and you see the the winning the the finish there with Crowslack laying on the court, he's the one that finishes it up. And Crowslack is a guy that is really taking his game to the next level this year. And I'm really impressed with his stuff. Um, and again, this group in, in total should they, they they've got um, you know the world ahead of them. And Born Dame has alluded to it at our first episode this year when I was able to speak to him, as well as his post game. Um, you know, he, he, he he's this is an expectation for his team is to win a conference championship. But I think from this point. It's about getting to that second weekend in uh, men's tennis, getting to that sweet 16 as we would make it equivalent to in basketball. He's made it to the round of 32 before, as he did last year, but it's that next step um, that these guys are looking to win. And so I think he has a team for it. The doubles has really pulled through for him. And as, as if anyone that follows college tennis knows that doubles point is absolutely crucial because then you only have to win half your singles matches. So he feels good, obviously, about his top pairing there with uh, Ray Queen and Horak. So if he's able, if he gets the doubles point, um, you know, just like I said, as I said, get half of those singles victory. And Ray Queen and Kamarowski give you that opportunity. Horak, when he's on, he's certainly a guy that could take this team to the next level. And you only got to win. You only got to get eight points to get to that second weekend. So this team is capable. They have many big wins under their belt. So we look forward to that selection committee. Um the selection show this coming up weekend. And then, of course, as I've already said, next week I'll be talking to Coach Boren Dame to break down his fifth straight conference championship as well as looking ahead to his first-round matchup. Now, on to somewhat bad news. We've got the baseball team. They have a really rough week. They only win one of their five contests. It does start the week out well with a home win against Austin P and a 16 to 15 walk-off winner. It was Gabe Jennings with a walk-off hit up the middle. And then against Tennessee Tech, they lose the Wednesday matchup by a score of 2 to 5 and then they face Conference USA newcomer Sam Houston State over the weekend in Huntsville, Texas. They lose the first night on a very close heartbreaker by a score of 3 to 4. They are run ruled on Saturday, one to eleven, and they drop the third game on Sunday by a score of two to three. So, uh, unlike what we typically see from the Raiders in regards to the run production, only scoring six games, six runs in three games, very unlike them. Um, and then we kind of have the typical um, bullpen blow up that we saw on Saturday, where they give up eleven runs. So, um, tough week for the Raiders. The reason I say it's bad news. Um, is that the Raiders are slowly slipping down uh, the standings. And for Conference USA, eight of the nine teams will make the Conference USA tournament. As it sits right now, they're tied for seventh. 
um, which technically means they're tied for eighth as well. So they're only one game ahead of last place, and the schedule does not get any easier for them. Um, they're going to play Western Kentucky this next weekend, and then they will face Jacksonville State, who is the one team that they are ahead of in Conference USA that will keep them above water in regards to making the tournament. Unfortunately for the Raiders, that contest is in Jacksonville, Alabama. So you're kind of, you know, you, you control your own destiny in regards to making the Conference USA tournament, but this team is just, they're just not getting it done right now. They've lost, um, they've lost four of their last, uh, sorry, they've lost five of their last six conference games, um, and, and they haven't won a series all year. So you, you, it, the, the future looks bleak to say the least. And with Western coming into town this weekend, maybe it being a rivalry in your home home field, you feel that there's an opportunity there that you can kind of, again, right the ship, get at least get to the Conference USA Tournament. And when you get there, you know, anything could happen as we've seen last year. So, um, but they're scheduled this week. They will play tonight in Clarksville uh, with a rematch there with Austin P, who I fully anticipate will try to get revenge from the walk-off this last week. And then, this weekend, they are back home at Reese Smith Jr. Field facing Western Kentucky. All the games are on ESPN+. Plus. The Friday matchup on the 26th is at 6 p.m., Saturday the 27th at 3, and then Sunday at 1 p.m. Softball, again, as a team that is further falling and from the graces, um, softball has now lost nine straight um, Conference USA contests, including this weekend's sweep in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So that will more than likely do the Lady Raiders in from making their conference tournament because in softball and conference USA, only the top six teams will make the tournament. Um, and with only three games left against New Mexico State, they are all but done. So this will be the last contest for the Lady Raiders. So if you haven't had the opportunity to go see them, this will be their last weekend um, in Murfreesboro. Their Friday first pitch will be at 6 p.m. Then on Saturday, it is at 4, and then Sunday, it is at 12 noon. And again, that is the final regular season finale. Men's tennis, they are currently finishing up their regular season, or I guess I should. this is the postseason, but they're finishing up their last match before the NCAAs um, in hopes that they can make it. As we sit right now on Monday night, they are in second place in the Conference USA Championships after just the first round. They are seven strokes behind Louisiana Tech. A uh, big shout out there to Luke Perkins, who is currently tied for third at three strokes under par. And then you got Michael Barnard, who's at even at tied for eighth place right now. So plenty of time, only seven strokes back. You're three strokes ahead of third place. Still a lot of shaking up that can happen um, with two more rounds to play. So um, keep your eyes peeled there in uh, Texarkana, Arkansas, as the Raiders try to repeat as conference champions. Track and field has been on a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, they will return back to action this weekend as they wrap up their regular season before the Conference USA Championships. They will be at the Music City Challenge in Nashville, Tennessee. So keep up for those updates over the weekend. And that will pretty much do us for the Blue Raider podcast today. I appreciate everyone tuning in and listening to our quick episode and taking the time to help me break down our newest additions on the basketball team i look forward to seeing those faces this upcoming season as well as hopefully touching base with them um, as we roll through our summer session here shortly some news um in regards to the blue raider podcast we're going to eventually start opening up an apparel store for fundraising and i think the ultimate goal there is um we're going to open up an nil store with some sponsored athletes and so i would stick around for some news on all of that as we as i've started to reach out to sponsor athletes i've already started to reach out to the ins and outs of doing the manufacturing and all that good stuff so it's it's exciting time for the blue raider podcast is in regards to marketing as well as supporting our local athletes and i think it's important that um i know i, I speak about it all the time when masaro has been on here twice that's kind of a big um, point of emphasis for me is the nil for these kids and i i get really excited about that because it's one of those things that when i was a college athlete i always thought was very important um, was to find a way to support your kids. At that time, it obviously wasn't money, but now we have the ability to do that. So I'm all about supporting these kids. Um, they work really hard, not only on the field, but they work really hard in the classroom. And so a lot of that needs to be recognized. So, um, But exciting news. Keep your eyes peeled for that, um, I, I, as well as supporting that and the Blue Raider podcast as well. So another way you can support us, obviously, is by listening to our episodes on all your favorite streaming services. If you haven't already, find us over at YouTube at Blue Raider Podcast. Follow us on all of our socials uh, at Blue Raider Pod. That's on Twitter, X, 
um, Instagram. We're also over on TikTok. We're on uh, YouTube Shorts if you haven't seen those as well. My personal account on Twitter is at Jake Bolden MP. Um, I've got all my stuff over there outside of just MTSU athletics as well as local sports, getting back into the high school things here pretty soon. So um, a lot to be excited about. Uh, again, for, for the Blue Raider podcast, keep your eyes peeled for all of that stuff. Um, thanks for tuning in. Don't miss next week's episode with coach with head men's tennis coach Jimmy Bourne Dame as we look forward to their NCAA tournament bid. Um, and until next time, go Blue.